Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we are looking at Exodus chapter 25. We're working our way through this book and we're in Exodus chapter 25 tonight. So we want to invite you to find a copy of the Bible and join us in Exodus chapter 25. We'll be there in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions, any concerns about class, anything that we can be praying about as a congregation, if there's some way that we can help you spiritually, uh, we invite you to reach out and let us know. You can give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274, or you could also send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org. We'd love to hear from you in any of those ways. Well, tonight we are back to the book of Exodus. So the people have left Egypt. They have received the Ten Commandments, as well as a good chunk of God's law at the base of Mount Sinai. And tonight, God starts communicating some plans for the tabernacle and for the furnishings in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was basically a large tent that was designed for worship, and it had to be portable. Obviously, it could not be a physical building. These people were on the move, and so it was a tent, a portable worship center. Uh, because these people are about to head out even further into the wilderness. So let's jump right into it tonight with the first paragraph. This is Exodus chapter 25, and tonight we'll be starting with verses 1 through 9. Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man whose heart moves him. You shall raise my contribution. This is the contribution which you are to raise from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, porpoise skins, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastpiece, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them according to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture. Just so you shall construct it. We know what comes next, the construction of the tabernacle and everything in it and around it so that the people can worship as God has instructed. However, obviously, before they build anything, they need to collect the materials. They can't just build this out of nothing. And so God has Moses start by telling the people to raise a contribution. And I hope we notice that this is to be a free will offering. In other words, this is not a tax. Uh, this is not a percentage. This is not some burdensome command. But the people are simply to give freely from the heart. And I don't know about to you, but to me, that sounds a whole lot like what God has instructed under the New Covenant. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, under the new law, Paul says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, so also here in Exodus, the first contribution is not a percentage uh, that is demanded of the people in terms of this law being issued, but instead it is a free will contribution from the heart. Well, they don't have cash, do they? And so, in particular, God is looking for gold and silver and bronze, as well as these other materials, cloth of various types, wood and oil and various animal skins and spices and, and precious stones. Uh, just a kind of a thought question here, something for us to mull over. These people were pretty much runaway slaves out there in the desert in the middle of nowhere. How in the world were these people supposed to come up with all of these luxurious items? Well, if you remember on their way out of Egypt, they were supposed to ask their neighbors for pretty much anything of value. If you remember that, and then their neighbors would feel compassion for them. This would be God uh, working through this. This would be God's way of paying them back for so many years of forced labor. So they are not leaving Egypt empty handed. And so they actually walked out of Egypt freely and they were loaded down with this stuff because their neighbors just piled it on. Their neighbors gave them all of these items of value. And God is now asking for a free will offering of some of those things uh, so that Moses can then oversee the building of a tent for worship. And how similar to the way that we give today. God has blessed us tremendously, and we certainly do not think of our giving as a tax. There is no percentage that has been levied upon us. You know, it's interesting, though, that when we give, 
it is a percentage, isn't it? Whatever we give, it is a percentage of what we have brought in over the previous week. Um, but it is not uh, a percentage that has been dictated under the law of God, but it is simply to be a free will offering, uh, similar to the way this was back then. The first collection that was taken was for the tabernacle, and it was not a particular percentage that was demanded. It was simply to be from the heart. And the goal is so that God has a place to live among them. Not that God necessarily needs a place to live, not like God is homeless, uh, but he would be establishing this place as a place to meet with his people. So it was for their benefit primarily. So for them, the place would be important, especially as they traveled through the wilderness. This, again, is not for God's benefit, uh, but for their simply to have a place where they could come and they could have this sense of meeting with the Lord. This was a special place. It was to be sanctified or set apart. And I just want us to notice also the use of the word sanctuary there. A lot of religious groups today refer to the church building or the, the place where they worship as a sanctuary. Uh, we don't have sanctuaries in the New Covenant in the same sense that they had under the Old. When we meet together at 302 Acewood Boulevard, that's just a building that we meet in. And I know it's special to us because we as a congregation own it. It's a safe place for us to go. We have some place for Bible classes. We have a place where we can uh, have fellowship together. We can eat together. We can have funerals there uh, and that kind of thing. But the building itself is not sacred. It is not a, uh, a sanctified building. Certainly the place that we meet in is not a sanctuary. And I think we just need to point that out. A lot of religious groups today, I think, uh, are an error on that in calling the place that they meet a sanctuary. So we would call it uh, a church building, a church facility, um, an auditorium. Think about the, the meaning of that word, some place where we listen or where we hear an auditorium, a, a hall or a meeting room. Uh, that's set up for listening to the word of God being preached. Well, in verse 9, God tells Moses that he will be providing a plan for the tabernacle, and Moses is to conduct everything and construct everything according to the pattern. And this is very important. Moses couldn't just make stuff up, but Moses was to actually build this tent exactly as God will go on to instruct. So let's continue then with Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 16. Exodus 25, verses 10 through 16. They shall construct an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, and one and a half cubits wide, and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and out you shall overlay it, and you shall make a gold molding around it, you shall cast four gold rings for it and fasten them on its four feet, and two rings shall be on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the, side of the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. You shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you." So notice first on their to-do list is the Ark. This is the first piece of furniture in this tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant. And this is where we are introduced to the cubit. A cubit is commonly thought to be the distance from the elbow to the fingertips. And as you can imagine, uh, a cubit would vary from one person to another, certainly from one culture to another. Uh, obviously, some people have longer arms than others. Uh, but generally speaking, the cubit was around 18 inches from the elbow to the tips of the fingers. Um, earlier today, I went ahead and I remeasured my, uh, my cubit. And uh, a cubit for me from the tip of my elbow to the tip of my fingers is 19 and a half inches. So uh, I guess I'm a little bit advanced. I'm, I'm an inch and a half longer in terms of the cubit for uh, uh, most people in the ancient world. And so you see a problem there. If you go trying to build something, different people have different cubits. Uh, several years ago, uh, one of the young men at church actually went to the Creation Museum down in Kentucky where they have a full-size replica of Noah's Ark, uh, not to be confused with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is obviously different from uh, Noah's Ark, and I just mentioned that because some people have said, ah, contradictions in the Bible, the Ark was too big to be carried. Well, there were two different Arks. Uh, but anyway, since this uh, young man was an engineering student, um, this was of kind of interest to him, you know, how to build stuff, how stuff is made and measuring and that. And so he got me an official cubit. So this is a measuring stick that is marked off in various cubits. There is an Egyptian cubit on here. Theirs was a little bit different from the Israelite cubit. 
And then there are also markings on here for um, a half cubit as well as a hand breadth, so the width of a hand. And, uh, you know, we may laugh at how inaccurate this might be to try to build a building based on the distance from a man's elbow to the tips of his fingers. And yet, obviously, if we think about it a little bit, without a bureau of weights and measures, a cubit was probably about as close to a universal measurement as people could get. And so that was the way that they measured things in the ancient world. And so the ark then was to be made out of acacia wood. It was to be two and a half cubits long. So if a cubit is 18 inches, then two cubits would be 36 inches, and then adding a half cubit would be nine inches. So the ark, therefore, was to be 45 inches long. So you guys know I am not good with numbers. Feel free to check me on that. But my understanding, at least, is assuming the 18-inch cubit, the Ark of the Covenant, was to be 45 inches long from left to right. Then it was to be one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high, or I think as we would measure it today, 27 inches uh, wide or deep and 27 inches high. So if I'm trying to you know, think of something today that's that size, you know, what do we have today that is 45 inches long by 27 high by 27 deep? Um, the best I can come up with is like an extra large igloo type cooler. Have you guys seen those huge white coolers that people maybe take out on the boat for a day of fishing? Those ginormous white coolers, something like that. If you could picture that, 45 inches from left to right, 27 high by 27 deep, that is... Uh, the size of the Ark of the Covenant. In our house, we have one of the steamer trunks that my parents were issued when they went to Jamaica in the Peace Corps many years ago. And so that is kind of roughly that size as well. It is liftable by one or two people, so it's not out of the range of, of liftability, we might say, so it is manageable, but it's large enough to contain some things. It's large enough to be uh, substantial. Um, if we were at our church facility, not our sanctuary, our church facility, our church building, if we were there, um, we might imagine something a little bit smaller than um, what was once our Lord's Supper table at the front of the auditorium. You know, uh, that's, I think, a little bit larger than 45 inches, but I would say roughly 27 inches high by 27 inches deep. So kind of a shortened version of that table up there at the front of the auditorium. So again, it's large enough to get the job done and hold a few things. It's small enough to be portable for many miles through the wilderness. Which leads us to the middle of this passage where we find that this wooden box is to be covered in gold. So that right there adds to, so, to the weight of it. And then it is to be made with a system of rings with uh, two poles on each side. So it was designed to be carried by several men who would share that load. They would grab those poles that had been put through the rings and then that way they could carry it around without touching it. And of course, that would be significant later in the Bible when David has it carried on an ox cart instead of by the poles. Do you remember that? They, did, they were not walking with it with the poles as they were supposed to do, as God told them to do, but they put it on a cart. And there was this guy named Uzzah who was walking beside the cart. The oxen kind of stumble a little bit and and Uzzah reaches out to steady the ark, which was a good move on his part. You, you don't want that thing to fall. Uh, but he dies. And, uh, you know, the lesson there, they should have been using the poles as God had instructed. But David failed uh, to do that. He failed to obey the Lord. And, and, you know, it looks like David should have paid the price. But they slow the thing down. Uh, David, as I remember that, I haven't reread this for a while. But he goes, he does the research. He realizes, oh, <laughs> that's what we should have done. And then he has the proper people carry it in the proper way for it to make it the rest of the way into the city of Jerusalem. Well, at the end, we find the first thing to be put in this Ark of the Covenant is the testimony. So it's the Ark of the Testimony, Ark of the Covenant, kind of a different translations of the same word. And later we find that this seems to be a reference to not the whole law, but rather the Ten Commandments. And uh, those, of course, were written on tablets of stone. So uh, those tablets would have gone inside the Ark. Well, let's continue with Exodus 25, verses 17 through 22. The next paragraph, Exodus 25, 17 through 22. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. 
Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Up in verse 17, notice we have instructions now for what God describes as a mercy seat. And when we compare the measurements, we find that the seat is to match the dimensions of the ark. It is to be the same length. It is to be the same depth. And it is to be placed on top of the ark. I would look at this almost as a lid. I think that's the way we would explain that today. This is the lid or the top of the, of the ark. So they are to make two gold cherubim, apparently a form of an angel or an angel-like being. We don't have a lot of information on cherubim. To me, they seem to be a class of angel. I would not swear my soul on that. That's just my impression from reading scripture. But these two cherubim are to face one another with their wings spreading upward, covering the mercy seat. Well, the purpose of the mercy seat then is to provide a place for God to meet with the people. And again, God repeats that this uh, testimony will be given to them. It will be placed in the ark. And to me, it's almost as if the testimony is to serve as something of a basis for God meeting with the people. So the testimony is a written record of God's agreement with the people. God plays a role, and then the people also play a role in that relationship. And that relationship certainly will be ongoing, according to verse number 22. Before we move on to the next paragraph, uh, I'm sharing one artist's rendition of the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on top of it. And I think the uh, caption to this said that this was Moses and Joshua bowing down before it. Uh, the painting is by James Tissot, a French artist. It was done around the year 1900, give or take a few years. And there was actually a date range on this painting. I don't know if it took him several years or if they were unsure as to exactly when it was done. But I think James Tissot died very early in the 1900s, so it, it was toward the end of his life. Uh, he's done a lot of illustrations on the Bible, and uh, I like a lot of what he's done. Uh, but this, of course, is one of many renditions of the Ark. I mean, we really have no true idea of what it looked like in real life other than the dimensions and the description that we have here in Exodus. And we could go on and on sharing uh, uh, paintings and uh, drawings and sketches of what people thought. But uh, this is at least one artist idea of what it might have looked like. So let's continue then with Exodus 25, verses 23 through 30. Exodus 25, 23 through 30. You shall make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long and one cubit wide and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a gold border around it. You shall make for it a rim of a handbreadth around it, and you shall make a gold border for the rim around it. You shall make four gold rings for it, and put rings on the four corners which are on its four feet. The rings shall be close to the rim as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, so that with them the table may be carried. You shall make its dishes and its pans and its jars and its bowls with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold. You shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. Well, the first piece of furniture was the ark. Now we come to a table. And like the ark, the table is also to be made out of acacia wood and converting cubits into something we understand. If I have calculated this correctly, uh, the table is to be 36 inches long by 18 inches uh, wide by 45 inches high. Uh, it is also to be covered in gold. Notice it is to have a, a border or a railing around it of a handbreadth wide, so I would guess, so nothing falls off the table. So a little rim or a lip or, or a ledge, uh, an edge around the table, so the width of a hand, four or five inches or so. And notice, like the ark, the table is also to be portable. Uh, complete with matching rings and poles, all covered with gold, just like those on the Ark of the Covenant. And then we have instructions for matching bowls and utensils, all made out of pure gold. 
and we learn at the end that this table is made to hold the bread of the presence. Uh, more details on this are, are coming, um, and I'm, I'm see, starting to see a picture here. You know how we like uh, bread, we like the smell of baking bread. I'm thinking God likes that as well. We'll see uh, references later in the Bible to a soothing aroma. You know, there's just something about meat cooking on a grill. There's something about the smell of baking bread that is just absolutely amazing. And it seems like in that sense, perhaps, we were made in the image of God, and we were made to appreciate that as well. So again, more details coming, uh, but we're starting here with this furniture. And uh, as with the other one, this is one artist rendition of the Table of Showbread. This is a model, I think from maybe a model of the tabernacle, perhaps in Jerusalem. I don't remember exactly the details on this, but uh, this is certainly a model of that table. And as I said with the Ark, there have been many, many, many reproductions of the Table of Showbread for illustration's sake. Uh, but this is at least one of those many possibilities. So you can see kind of the length and the depth and the, uh, the height of it there and the purpose. You got the gold pitchers, the gold uh, utensils on top, and you got the fresh bread on top of it. Well, let's go to the last paragraph tonight. Let's close with Exodus 25, verses 31 through 40. Exodus 25, verses 31 through 40. Then you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand and its base and its shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. Six branches shall go out from its sides, three branches of the lampstand from its one side, and three branches of the lampstand from its other side. Three cups shall be shaped like almond blossoms in the one branch, a bulb and a flower, and three cups shaped like almond blossoms in the other branch, a bulb and a flower. So for six branches going out from the lampstand. And in the lampstand, four cups shaped like almond blossoms, its bulbs and its flowers. A bulb shall be under the first pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the second pair of branches coming out of it, and a bulb under the third pair of branches coming out of it, for the six branches coming out of the lampstand. Their bulbs and their branches shall be of one piece with it, all of it shall be one piece of hammered work of pure gold. Then you shall make its lamps seven in number, and they shall mount its lamps so as to shed light on the space in front of it. Its snuffers and their trays shall be of pure gold, and it shall be made from a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. See that you make them after the pattern for them which was shown to you on the mountain. So we have the ark, we have the table, now we have a lamp stand. Notice it is made out of solid gold. And we have some details. It is to be hammered. It is to have bulbs and flowers. And I kind of get lost in all of the details here. It's hard for me to picture this. And I'm, I'm assuming God, of course, gave Moses more details as he enabled the craftsmen to do this. But a total of seven branches and lamps coming out from the base, three on one side, three on the other, one in the middle. And I think we would recognize this today as the menorah. And we've seen this, of course, with uh, Hanukkah not too long ago here. But uh, the lampstand, the purpose of it was to provide light in the tabernacle. So it wasn't just for decorations. Uh, it, it had a function to provide light. And we're heading in this direction, but pretty much everything in the tabernacle, including the walls, I believe, were to be covered in gold. So any light source in a fairly small room like that would certainly reflect and provide quite a bit of light and that was the purpose of the lampstand. In addition to the lampstand they were to make snuffers and trays, uh, the utensils out of pure gold, everything is to be made according to the pattern shown to Moses on the mountain. And uh, this whole concept by the way repeated a couple times here in Exodus 25 is actually quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 and uh, hate to jump back into Hebrews, so I'm not going to go too deep into that right now. We, we've done that this uh, past year. Uh, but the point of that passage in Hebrews 8 ultimately was making the point that Jesus is a priest who serves in a much better sanctuary. So I'm just saying the author of Hebrews refers back to this and, and said, you know, it's important to make things according to the pattern. And the, the tabernacle that Jesus serves in today is much better than the one uh, described to Moses. Um, this is one artist rendition of the lampstand, and again, you know, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but this at least gives us, I think, uh, some idea of what it might have looked like. And I want us to notice uh, the base on this guy. You know, I don't think there was a whole lot about the actual base, like the weighted part that it sits on, but keep in mind 
that pattern right there, if you could see that at the very bottom of your screen, this is something I didn't think about until I started recording class tonight, but that base right there is going to look a little bit familiar. We're going to come back to that in just a few moments. All right, as we close tonight, I want to share an image from the um, Arch of Titus. This is found in the uh, ruins of ancient Rome. I know a number of you have probably been there. Uh, we have, we saw this in person a number of years ago. Uh, Titus was the Roman general who was sent to wipe the city of Jerusalem off the face of this earth. Uh, the Jews had rebelled in the late 60s. Uh, Rome, the emperor, had had enough of it, and he sent Titus over there to clean things up and wipe them off the face of the earth. And uh, that was the one stone not left on top of another. That's that reference from Jesus in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus predicted there are some people standing here today who will see this happen. They will still be alive. So within one generation of Jesus saying that around uh, 30 AD or so, uh, this is going to happen. Well, in downtown ancient Rome, there is this huge arch dedicated to Titus. So when Titus comes back, gives the report, brings the loot back to the city of Rome, uh, the emperor builds this arch in his honor uh, to commemorate the uh, sacking and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And it is one of the few really uh, good quality structures still remaining today in the uh, ancient Roman kind of downtown uh, government area. Uh, but this was the, uh, uh, the emperor's way of um, honoring Titus' accomplishment and putting down that Jewish rebellion. Well, inside the arch, there is a carving depicting Roman soldiers looting the furniture from inside the temple. And I don't know how well you can see this, uh, but I have circled that carving on the inside of that arch. So I kind of put a red circle just to give you an idea of where it is. And you can actually walk underneath this and look up to it. It's just above my eye level to give you some sense of scale. And so this is a close-up of that carving. So notice the carving depicts Roman soldiers looting the furniture from inside the temple. And I don't know how well you can see this, but I, we can uh, very clearly, we can most clearly see the lampstand on the left. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we see some silver trumpets there on the right. I believe we can also see uh, a table behind the trumpets. To me, I, so most archaeologists have said that is a table. I look at that. It looks like a table. It's got legs. It's got a top. It's got some kind of a, a object, a bowl or vase on top of it. And I mean, it's incredibly sad to see this, but it's also interesting to see this depicted so far away from Jerusalem, way over there, hundreds of hundreds of miles away in the city of Rome. Um, by the way, remember how I mentioned the base of the lampstand and that artist rendition? Notice the base of this lampstand here and how similar that is. So I'm guessing that the artist might have uh, taken this into consideration as he or she made that uh, uh, depiction or sculpture or reproduction of that lampstand. But anyway, th this is actual history. And as I stood there looking at this in real life, just dumbfounded. I mean, it, it was yet another confirmation that the Bible records real history. This is not made up stuff. You know, the lampstand, the table of showbread, uh, they didn't just exist in someone's imagination. This is not some fairy tale. But these were very real pieces of furniture that were actually looted by the Romans in 70 AD. So I thought you might appreciate some of the uh, images there. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus 25. So we've now started looking at the instructions for building the tabernacle and uh, the furniture inside the tabernacle. Ultimately, everything that we have uh, read about tonight is merely a shadow. And I don't mean it wasn't real. I mean, it, it was real. But it was foreshadowing what was coming uh, that would come later in Jesus. Uh, because he is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. We come to God at the mercy seat, not a literal mercy seat, but now we approach through Jesus and so on. So this was just a, a, a flimsy, uh, you know, a reproduction ahead of the fact, almost we might say, of what was coming to be much better later because Jesus is better. All right, thank you for joining us tonight. Again, if you have any questions, any comments about class, if there's some way we can help, something we can do to encourage you, if there's something we need to be praying about as a church, we have a weekly prayer list. I'll pray for you personally and privately if you want me to. Uh, we can make it public to the church if you want that as well so more people are praying on your behalf. Uh, send me an email. 
info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also send a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274, and uh, we would absolutely love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you alone are worthy of all praise. You alone are the only true God, the creator of heaven and earth. And tonight we're thankful for what you've told us about the furniture that you intended for the tabernacle. But tonight we are especially thankful that we can approach you directly in prayer, not through a human priest in a tent somewhere out in the wilderness. And we're not praying through someone who would carefully approach a gold-covered box in, in fear uh, once a year, but we now come to you directly through your Son. And we know tonight that your Son truly is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.